Welcome everyone. I'm Penny Lewis, Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the webinar moderator today for Principles of Ecological Landscape Design, Getting It Right. This is one of the presentations we're offering in our Focus on Sustainability webinar series, a series developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By working together, we're able to expand the reach of our individual programs. If you're not familiar with the organizations, we're all nonprofit and largely volunteer groups in the United States. The groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and Ecolandscape California. If you have any questions for the presenter, you can type in the question window at any time during the broadcast, and we'll be taking your questions at the end of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters, Lyle Allman and Travis Beck. Lyle Allman comes to us from the temperate old growth rainforest of Washington State. Lyle holds an advanced degree in forest resources management and a professional certificate in landscape design. Lyle's career has taken him to many landscapes throughout Europe and the Pacific Northwest and now to the East Coast, where he works as the forestry stewardship educator for the University of Maryland Extension. Travis Beck is the Director of Horticulture at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, where he oversees the care and evolution of 582 acres of nat native plant gardens and natural areas. Prior to Mount Cuba, Travis worked at the New York Botanical Gardens, where he was responsible for large landscape projects such as landscape design and construction. Travis is a registered landscape architect and holds a master's degree in horticulture. Travis's book, Principles of Ecological Landscape Design, applies current scientific thinking to the design and management of successful, sustainable landscapes. Welcome, Travis and Lyle. Thank you, Penny. Hi, this is Lyle. Um, I'm with Travis back here at uh, Mount Cuba Center on a beautiful late winter day here in northern Delaware. Um, to start off, Travis, why don't you tell us a little about Mount Cuba Center and its overall mission? Sure thing. I've prepared a couple of slides. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if you're not familiar with us, Mount Cuba Center is a botanical garden. We're located in the beautiful Brandywine region of northern Delaware, along with many other public gardens. Uh, one thing that distinguishes us is that our collections are focused on native plants and the region that we are focused on is the eastern temperate forest. And our mission is also different from other botanical gardens in that we really are seeking uh, to reach out and motivate the public at large in order to create a movement of people dedicated to conservation of the environment. We're uh, best known for our naturalistic gardens, and we'll uh, look into those today. We especially are well regarded for our collections of spring ephemerals. We have a nationally accredited collection of trillium, for example. But we also have uh, an area of formal gardens around the historic main house. And we manage over 500 acres of natural land. We'll be looking at uh, examples from all of those areas today. Well, Travis, your book, Principles of Ecological Landscape Design, is, is a really phenomenal resource. And um, I'd like to look at how you applied the principles in this book here at Mount Cuba Center um, by delving into what is ecological landscape design. What makes this different from sustainable design or conservation landscaping? Um, you know, sure. we might like to see how the principles in the book apply, and how you and your colleagues apply these principles here at Mount Cuba Center. Well, for me, I think ecological design is is not just a buzzword, but it really is uh, landscape design based on the science of ecology, and it's distinguished from sustainable landscaping, for example, though the two are clearly closely related in that I think so much of the focus in sustainability circles is on resource use, 
inputs and outputs, uh, water efficiency, etc. Whereas ecological landscape design is focused on creating whole systems. Another uh, quote from the book that I think summarizes this is really the goal of ecological landscape design as I see it, I'm sure many of you uh, are aligned with this thinking, is to take what we can learn from natural systems and then apply those to create high performing landscapes that have a unified, that unify our design goals with the way things actually work in nature. Sort of like biomimicry, sort of taking what nature does and sure. adapting and doing it better. Well, we're going to see how the principles in, the, in, in your book apply to how you and your colleagues are applying these principles here at Mount Cuba Center. And to do this, we'd like to move through different areas of Mount Cuba's property, starting out with the formal gardens near the nearest house, and then work our way out through the through the naturalistic gardens and and even out into the natural land area. Um, so if you'd like, we'll only start with the, the formal garden. Sure. Yeah, let me show everyone a few images um, of our formal gardens. This is a, an aerial view of the main house, again, which was built in 1937 to 1939. And the formal gardens uh, were constructed beginning in that, that same period. And you can see. Uh, some of them here in this landscape. We actually have alleys of trees on the property, another alley of lilacs. Um, and then one area I want to take a little bit more time to tell you about, which is uh, an area that was designed by the landscape architect Marion Coffin. And uh, construction took place in 1950. And this is just off the, uh, the south end of the house. And we uh, decided just this last year to renovate the, uh, the left portion of that area, which we're calling the South Garden. So you can see that area outlined on the left there. And here is our uh, new design for that area, that sort of schematically. And the concept was to really enliven the area by creating these new uh, mixed borders of all native plants. Some of the plants that we're featuring uh, are shown on this page, sort of an early summer view with a, a soft color palette. And then as we move later in the season, colors intensify. We just installed this garden in the fall. There are a few shots of it shortly after installation. So our hope is that these plants really bite in over the winter and uh, come spring, take off and really uh, deliver a beautiful experience for our guests here. Well, this is really wonderful, Travis. I'm really excited to see how the South Garden has been, uh, the landscape design has been um, renovated. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing how this layering effect uh, is sort of uh, progresses over the seasons. Um, and this will be open, I guess, when you... When April 1st, first. yeah. April 1st, okay. Yeah, um, well, in the context of, of such a formal garden aesthetic, what, what ecological landscape principles have been considered in this project? Well, an, an obvious one that I, I think most of us consider in all of our work is taking advantage of plant adaptations in order to put the right plant in the right place. One of the reasons that we had to renovate this garden is that the, uh, the pre-existing plantings were failing. We were attempting to use uh, a series of native deciduous azaleas to uh, create a color progression similar to what Marianne Coffin had originally designed. But the, uh, the shade was no longer what it was at the outset. The, uh, the soil was not uh, performing to the liking of the azaleas, and so they were really failing. So we came in with a new set of plants. Uh, again, these are all native to our region, eastern temperate forest, broadly speaking. And uh, they're ones that are adapted to a more full sun environment and also to a, a 
well-drained soil. So our hope is that all of them uh, will really perform well in this setting, again, just by matching their adaptations to the conditions on site. You call it like right plant, right place. Yeah, that sort exactly. of thing. Right. Well, in your book, you, you talk also about how to combine plants in a design mm -hmm. landscape. Um, let's see, how have you been able to achieve that? Well, I think so often when we talk about combining plants, the considerations are primarily aesthetic, and we're looking at uh, the progression of, of flower color, the uh, texture of the foliage, and those were certainly considerations in this project. Um, but we tried to add into that another element, which is so important when combining plants, which is how are they going to compete against one another in a garden setting. And as you can see, this is not a, a mixed plant thing with uh, things really working through each other. The plants are uh, intentionally placed in a traditional manner in, in adjacent blocks. But in each case, we tried to understand how the plants were going to grow and compete against the plants next to them. So for instance, uh, we used the switchgrass Shenandoah, which is, of the switchgrass, is a relatively well-behaved one, but still a competitive uh, species. So we placed that next to other equally strong competitors like giant coneflower or bluebird aster or in other cases, the, uh, the Baptisia that we have, so that those plants won't overrun each other, but hopefully keep themselves in place. Mm -hmm. you know, and we'll see how this all plays out over time. I, I can't promise that we did a perfect job initially, but it was certainly one factor that we considered when combining the plants along with the aesthetic one. Right, so you're looking sort of like honoring the competitive hierarchy among yeah. the entire palette of the uh, of the garden. Absolutely. You see, you know, what what really holds up competitively well with its neighbors mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we move from the South Garden um, to um, the Trial Garden, which is nearby. Um, you know, I've heard all about a number of interesting uh, research projects that are going on down in the Trial Garden. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the Trial Garden is an area where for a number of years we have been conducting evaluations of various groups of plants to determine their suitability for landscape use in our region. Um, so we've done this with asters, coneflowers, uh, more recently with cupera, and then our latest report that was issued is on coreopsis, which are shown here, both annual and perennial coreopsis. So these trials uh, since their beginning have looked at uh, questions like disease resistance and how well the plants flower and over what a period of time. But recently we've been adding in some ecological factors into the evaluation. So we partnered with the University of Delaware and this is Owen Cass, one of the graduate students who's been working on the project. And have looked at issues like uh, which pollinators are using uh, which of these plants. And what he's doing here is actually uh, taking nectar samples and analyzing them for their sugar content. So we hope to be able to uh, make some comments on the nutritional value of the nectar that's uh, taken from different species and also different cultivars of the plants that we're evaluating. This is the Monarda trial, which is ongoing right now. Hmm. And I'll just mention quickly that um, our latest report, the Coreopsis report, is available for download on our website at the link shown there. Well, I know that Mount Cuba Center is really at the leading edge of developing uh, a number of new um, varieties of native plant uh, cultivars. Um, do you want to talk a little more about that uh, issue regarding uh, safe species uh, versus the, the cultivars? Sure. So this is a really hot topic these days. Uh, now Cuba does evaluate and also, as you mentioned, introduce cultivars. Our newest uh, Coreopsis is a Coreopsis tripterus gold standard 
which is a, uh, a very upright and floriferous coreopsis that performed really well in our trials. And we're partnering with North Creek Nurseries to begin to get that out into the industry this year. So we're very excited about that. But you know, the question that is often asked is, are these cultivated varieties uh, inferior to the straight species in their ability to support pollinators or feed insect herbivores or you know, generally provide ecosystem right. services? Um, and obviously, cultivars have a more limited genetic range, which creates issues of its own when used broadly in the landscape. But what we're beginning to find in the trials is that it's not clear cut that straight species are always uh, preferable to the cultivars. Uh, there's quite a degree of variation in the pollinators that are attracted to the different plants and the quantity of the nectar that's provided. Uh, we'll find out more about the quality of that nectar and also just the, the abundance, the number of pollinators that come from plants. Um, so the, the research will really be published uh, probably a year or so from now after we collect one more season's worth of data. Um, but I think it's going to be a very interesting and complicated picture which suits a uh, scientific look at the natural world. Yeah, I think you know this is a very rich discussion. Um, but, um, it's going on in, in, in uh, native plant gardening, uh, naturalistic landscape design. Um, and you know, I, I've looked at this and, and listened to a lot of different views on this uh, from from the entire spectrum of of um, ideas. And you know, one thing that you know you brought up a really good point is 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 considering this issue from the uh, vantage point of providing e ecological services. You know, in terms mm -hmm. of, for instance, the quality of nectar production. Um, you know, and, and how that might be a driving force in terms of not only bringing more native plants into mainstream garden practices, practices but also um, uh, really sort of, um, of uh, uh, building out you know, a, a larger role for native plants in providing a, a number of different ecosystem services. Absolutely, and that's what we hope to be able to uh, increasingly do with our evaluations and even our introductions is say, Here's a plant that we know is going to do well in your garden in this region. We know it's going to provide a lot of interest to its flowers or its foliage or um, whatever the particular qualities are. And we know that it's going to provide ecosystem services in the form of habitat for pollinators. Uh, is the, the first one that we're evaluating. Sure. And you know, another thing is, you know, we talk about it, um, or, or native bars. Um, Somewhat general, uh, limited uh, range of, of uh, propagation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, out in the, out in the in the field, you know, it begins to start uh, raising questions about whether you know the mixing of, of or perhaps the you know compromising of wild genetics is as much of an issue as you might know, think it is. Well, I mean, the genetic issue is one of the considerations. Um, when using cultivars, certainly you get that reliability in terms of performance because you've seen the, uh, you know, the actual genetic material before, mm -hmm. um, but you don't have the serendipity that genetic variation introduces. From the research that I've heard, you know, I, I don't know that we need to be especially concerned about outbreeding depression and swamping the genetics of local populations by planting a, a cultivated variety nearby, but of course it all depends on the circumstances and the, uh, the rarity of the genetics you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. and yeah, just to circle back real quickly too, I think you know what, you, what you're doing here with um, these new cultivar um, research you're doing is, is really um, helping to uh, sort of synergize the um, both the both the, the principles of not only of ecological variation in terms of genetics um, and ecological performance, but also aesthetic performance as well. And I think that's a very big consideration when we talk about um, 
psychological landscape as well. Well, it's one of our, our challenges is marrying the, uh, the aesthetic to that ecological performance. Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't we move out from the trial garden and go into the, the, this wonderful uh, naturalistic uh, garden environment that Mount Cuba is so famous for? Yeah, sure. Um, just to give you all a couple of images of our, our naturalistic gardens here. Um, this is uh, our meadow, and it's uh, surrounded by a couple of, uh, of gardens that are seen on the edges of this photograph. And you know, people always ask me or assume uh, that what we're doing with these naturalistic gardens is trying to you know, recreate a, uh, a plant community that's found in nature. And that's really not the case. Um, Taking the example of the meadow here, it was known to the uh, the Copeland family and some of the early staff who worked here as the sage field, which I believe is the corruption of uh, sedge, as in broom sedge, the Andropogon virginicus, which you see in this photo. So there is a natural community at the uh, basis of this garden that was created, but since then it certainly has been gardened and added to. Here's another shot from the opposite end of the meadow, one of the most especially floriferous sections with the black-eyed Susan and the asters there. So we've punched it up for aesthetic impact, we've diversified it for uh, teaching and collections purposes, and it really is uh, an evolving community, mm -hmm. not one that is intended to duplicate any particular exactly. natural one. Right, and this sort of raises the, 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 the whole discussion, the questions about you know, whether we are, um, as gardeners, as landscape designers, if we are driving uh, these um, ecological landscapes towards historical reference conditions, uh, or towards novel uh, landscapes, mm -hmm. you know, you see, you know, that that novelty is sort of inherent in, in genetic and ecosystem variation. Yeah, and I think that we have to acknowledge that as part of this movement, I hope towards increasing the amount of ecological landscape design, we are stewards of the natural world, and it needn't we needn't see a duality between pristine wilderness on the one hand and scary strip mall landscapes on the other hand. Right. Um, really we can create functional and beautiful spaces at every point in between on that continuum. Absolutely, especially to that degree in which we really understand, appreciate, and exercise our role as members of that ecosystem, mm -hmm. as active players within the ecosystems that we are um, that we're um, designing for. And I think what's really interesting to me in, in terms of thinking about plant communities in relation to this is how there can be a, a dual role between natural processes unfolding and uh, human intervention. I wanted to just show a, mm -hmm. an image of the moss bank here. And we have a, a great uh, video that we've been able to see an interview between Pamela Copeland, who was one of the founders of, of Mount Cuba and one of the originators of its gardens, and uh, Dr. Richard Lighty, who was the uh, first director of horticulture here, in which they discussed the origins of this area. And uh, she really says, you know, this was such a challenging area that at first I just stood back to see what would happen. And as the shade from the trees increased, the moss came in. And then that gave her the uh, sort of design concept for the area. And she began to add things, uh, such as the trillium that you see here in this picture. I don't know whether the bluets that you see uh, originated on their own or were added. But it really becomes a process of community assembly. And I think that's the sense in which the Mount yeah, Cuba Center Gardens are 
communities is that they have emerged through a process of assembly and they're composed of plants that grow together on our particular site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you really weave this together beautifully in your book by adding in this, this temporal component of the fourth dimension where it's very much a three-dimensional environment. Um, so in terms of this um, the biodiversity of, of different not only ecosystems, but you know, ecosystem diversity, but as well, you know, within you know, given ecosystem communities of different plants and different strata of of the um, of the ecosystem, what role do you see species richness versus functional biodiversity in this community? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, what 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 would we do if you know uh, we were looking at you know our own residential properties or, or a client's property where you know we want to what do we want to do? We want to maximize species richness? Well, this diversity question is really an, an interesting one, especially for us here at a botanical garden where having a broad collection and representing many different taxa is an important part of our project. Um, I don't know that every home gardener needs to attempt to, uh, to create a Noah's Ark, um, but where we all overlap is in this idea of functional biodiversity or biodiversity that helps us um, achieve the landscape goal that we want to have. Um, so I'll just show you a couple other pictures here. This is an edge environment. Uh, off looking back at the meadow again, we have one of our woodland gardens here, the woods path. And again, these are composed of, of plants from a broad area throughout our range brought together uh, in ways that we hope uh, not only create a beautiful garden but provide ecological function. And so the diversity serves to, say, you know, create different layers. So if, if you're designing that residential landscape, you, know, you might want to have a canopy layer in a tree. You might not just want to have one tree or one species of tree. You, know, you might want to have several that perform that same canopy function. And then the same down in an understory and shrub layer, having several different species that uh, perform those goals. And then again, down on the ground plane, and uh, having plants that will provide cover for a living cover for the ground throughout the year. So you might have spring ephemerals occupying that particular niche and the more summer herbaceous plants for later. So for each of the functions in the landscape, it's valuable to have multiple plants performing them. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think biodiversity begins to, to really count in uh, sort of a practical sense beyond just the, uh, the virtue of helping support a diversity of life. Sure, and that whole food web. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to take it from the, you know, the other direction, you know, if we were looking at, you know, the, the, the splendid, um, just just the the, uh, the chaos of a natural ecosystem, and we wanted to distill that or abstract its essence, you know, we were looking at, you know, different different strata and thinking, well, you know, in that forest edge that we saw earlier, what um, among the, the 10 to 12 or 15 different uh, you know, smaller uh, herbaceous plants that we find there, what possibly two to three to five of those do we want to cultivate in their edge? You know, mm -hmm. um, how do we want to distill the essence of that natural edge in a way that really honors its diversity and is not only, you know, obviously functionally manageable, um, but also um, aesthetically? Um, yeah. Well, the other point I'd, I'd add to that, it's been helpful for me to think about the question of relative abundance. Mm -hmm. So you know, an important measure is not just species richness, how many species you have, but which of those are more predominant than others. So you know, if you had selected your three to five species, or maybe even it was you know, all the way up to you know, eight or ten of that dozen that you were talking about, but you know, two or three of them might be really the uh, majority of the plants that you put out there. 
and that creates the visual continuity that you are seeking in a more designed landscape. Sort of sweeps and masses. And yeah, you could. Sure. Um, and then the others are there kind of in supporting roles. And they might, at some point in the future, if conditions shift, uh, themselves become the dominant plants, and that's the value of including them. Mm -hmm. But relative abundance can help us uh, combine diversity with a designed approach. Well, yeah, I mean, you're talking about, you know, that, that, that you know, accommodating uh, uh, shifts over time in, in natural ecosystem dynamics. And certainly, you know, one of the greatest values of biodiversity is resilience, mm -hmm. as you said. So we, we can actually go and look, at, look up for into the, into the tree canopy and talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, resilience is something that's really on my mind these days in relation to our tree canopy. Just to share a couple of historical images, when the Copeland family moved to this property in the 1930s, it was a, a farm. And there's evidence of this uh, area being farmed since the 1700s. So you know, it had been cleared a long time ago. And uh, apart from some adjacent woodlands, it was pretty clear at the beginning. So the Copelands you know, built their house, began to plant the gardens, and they began to plant trees. And they continued planting trees all the way up until uh, Mrs. Copeland passed away in 2001. And we've continued that ourselves ever since. And we've created here a, uh, a woodland canopy for much of our gardens. And it's essential, as we saw in that last study, of providing the environment for all of these other plants that we want to, to have here. But it's something that, uh, that needs caretaking. Oh, definitely. <laughs> you know, one, one thing we find is that um, we have gaps that, that emerge in the canopy for a, a variety of reasons. And I've just uh, included this, this quote to share because I think it talks about the, uh, the advantages of gaps in creating a more heterogeneous canopy with the diversity of trees again and also a sort of structural diversity in the landscape. Yeah, a lot of these gap scale disturbances are natural uh, disturbance events and frankly I think a lot of our management approach to naturalistic landscapes uh, benefits from really appreciating and certainly um, uh, emulating to some degree that heterogeneity. And not only, you know, obviously structural heterogeneity in terms of the uh, cap gaps, but also in terms of you know, uh, functional uh, functional diversity as well as species that, that are uh, dominant in different strata of our campus. Yeah, and um, a lot of this is driven by disturbance. We have uh, events happen here that are beyond our control. We're located on the top of the hill, so here's a photo of a lightning strike that took place, yeah. um, taking out one of our trees. Mm -hmm. So we lose trees to, to lightning, to wind throw. It's gone. Yeah, that tree had to come out. Um, but then we also are beginning to use this model of disturbance and gap succession to, to ourselves plan the evolution of the tree canopy. So this is a photo, I mean a, a map showing all of the hemlocks that are planted at Mount Cuba Center. Hemlocks were a desirable tree for the Copelands. They provided evergreen screening. They grew really well on the site. And so hundreds of them were planted across the property. And then when the uh, Woolly Adelgid moved in in the 1990s, these trees began to decline. And we really have more on the property than we can take care of. So we've begun prioritizing the trees. You can see the ones in black are shown as our more primary trees for the moment. The ones in blue are secondary trees, which receive less care, and the ones in, with the red labels um, actually were slated for removal and have been removed. 
So each of these little patches that we remove opens up an opportunity for us to reinitiate succession and plant a new group of trees. So this is one such gap that we created earlier this last season by removing some hemlocks. And then here's a plan view of that site with the existing trees shown. We went ahead and uh, cataloged the seedlings that were coming up and identified a number of them that were desirable and in good locations that we allowed to, or will allow to uh, grow on. And then we planned in some additional plantings. And when we add plantings like this, you know, one, one thing we try to do is increase the overall diversity of our canopy. So, you know, for instance, we, we have oaks in the canopy, but we want to have more and more different ones. Uh, we're mm -hmm. very short on maples, so that was one thing that we added in here. Um, we are very short on birches, so we added birches in. And we even threw in a couple of uh, chestnuts that we got courtesy of the American Chestnut Foundation. Excellent. So we're going to try those as well. And then one thing we're playing with right now is appropriate densities of plantings. Um, I think we don't want to plant in a specimen style where we anticipate the mature size of the tree and you know leave it 30 to 40 foot uh, diameter patch to grow in. Uh, we want these trees to, to work with each other and against each other over a period sure. of time uh, and you know, we'll see mm -hmm. how that plays out. Right. We want to, we want to mimic the actual competitive um, landscape that these trees would be growing in at the ages and sizes that they are fine, which is going to be rather dense, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in their initial phase. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's hard to fight against one's landscape design urges, you know, no matter how tight they seem in a landscape plan, no matter how uh, small you make the planned diameter of those circles in relation to what you know the trees are capable of, when you go and plant them on the site, you still feel like, wow, there's a lot of empty space here. Exactly. And that's not how nature plants trees, actually. You know, when you seed fall, thousands of crop tools are, you know, germinating on a given spot of ground. And over time, nature will cull some of those individuals that are less competitive. Yep. You know, and that's kind of what we're doing over time is we ourselves are, are, are capturing that mortality. Um, and creating more growing space for trees that are more commensurate with the, the growing space that trees of that size need mm -hmm. at that point in their development. Right. And the other factor we're trying to figure out how to weigh in is the resulting life of this. Right. Because right. we're not just growing trees for trees' sake, but also to uh, mm -hmm. create a larger environment and support herbaceous plants and shrub plants sure. underneath them. So it's, yeah. a, it's a challenge. Yeah. We're still trying to figure out what the right balance is, and it will probably vary circumstance to circumstance. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what you're doing when you're managing forest canopy structure, is that you're really managing the light quality, you know, underneath in the understory. You know, um, when you look at that, uh, that gap of sunlight um, effect, I mean, that's an ideal environment for so many uh, understory plants to go in. Uh, because again, going back to diversity, it creates that uh, that heterogeneity of um, light values, um, and it promotes, of course, the greatest and uh, widest spectrum of diversity in the history of plant composition as well. The other thing, just since you mentioned the you know, heterogeneity and diversity, the, the theoretical model that's been most helpful to me in thinking about this approach to regenerating our canopy is that of patch dynamics, that we want to create a complex mosaic within our tree canopy where we have many different patches of many different ages with different compositions mm -hmm. of trees within them. And I think that's what's going to make our tree canopy most resilient in the long run. Right, right, creating that, that whole uh, diversity of different uh, microsites, uh, mm -hmm. conditions and microsite mm -hmm. um, 
we were able to as well. Yeah. Um, you know, as we kind of look out at the edge, it's naturalistic to argue here. We really start to bring in something that uh, you know, Mount is so much bigger than its garden areas. It's natural land. It's a rather extensive. Yeah, we've got uh, 532 acres of natural lands, um, and those are a mix of woodlands and former agricultural fields, uh, some of which are you know, still hayed and some of which are managed in a variety of different ways. So we've got quite a fun uh, set of conditions to work with here. Well, how are you applying the principles of landscape ecology, the ones that you talk about in your book on these extensive natural lands? Well, one way is by uh, thinking more carefully about uh, how our landscape relates to the adjacent uh, landscapes and creating connectivity between them. So this is an image that uh, it was created by an ecologist with the state of Delaware named Robert Cox in a report that he prepared for us. And it shows these three different uh, blocks of forest that are in existence. Um, and what separates one from another uh, is roads or, or open areas. And Cox's point in, uh, in sharing this graphic with us is that there's really great potential to increase the amount of interior forest and uh, especially where we can connect and bridge across some of these uh, gaps that have emerged. So that's become a, a guiding principle for us is trying to increase our connectivity with the surrounding landscape and create these uh, patches that really have a, a larger interior area because Patch shape is in, important for us. Those edges are where we see the greatest amount of invasive species uh, entering our landscape. They require the most management work on our parts. And also this very fragmented landscape is very suitable for white-tailed deer, which are over abundant in our area and are having negative impacts on regeneration in our forests. So I think there are multiple benefits to Absolutely. trying to change these patch shapes. So yeah, I mean you, you know deer are uh, preferential to edge habitats, um, and this is a really wonderful way to start thinking about um, alternative methods of addressing overpopulations of deer. Um, certainly, we know that the larger this patch, the smaller relative. Um, um, size of the of the edges. Mm -hmm. It's just a you know, basic principle. Yeah. Let, me, let me show you um, some of the planning we've been doing to uh, identify areas that we want to reforest and prioritize those. So this is some analysis we did in GIS in each of the colored areas. Is currently a field that uh, we intend to reforest, and we analyzed each of those places based on several factors, including the steepness of the slopes, the proximity to water, uh, the quality of the existing vegetation based on some vegetation survey data that we had collected, and then also the extent to which reforesting that particular pixel would decrease the amount of edge and increase the amount of core forest. So the, uh, the blue areas are the higher priorities for us to reforest. Right. You know, as you increase these uh, forest um, patches, of course, that you were just talking about increasing the interior, it really addresses the, 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 the paucity, uh, the lack of, of forest interior habitat for many species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we are um, planning on initiating some uh, surveys of indicator species of interior forest habitat mm -hmm. um, to hopefully you know, document not only that we are increasing the number of acres that are forested, but that we're seeing a biological response from the, the ecosystems that we manage. 
Well, you know, um, you're in addressing these landscape scale um, ecological issues here on your natural lands here at Mount Kiva. I'm wondering how you're um, uh, able to apply these landscape ecology principles to the landscape like metapopulations, island biogeography, those sorts of things. Well, take for instance these populations of uh, you know, interior forest dwelling species like the wood thrush, you know, the fragments of landscape, they're more isolated from one another. Uh, the fundamental idea in island biogeography is that the, the larger your island and the closer it is to the source population, the more of any particular species you're going to be able to support. So um, we hope that by increasing the size of our metaphorical islands, these forest patches, and uh, increasing their proximity one to another through connecting them, we will um, see an uptick in those populations. One other thing I did want to uh, mention is uh, that we're taking an experimental approach to this reforestation. This is uh, the first of those areas that we uh, had prioritized and begun planting in last season. It was a three and a half acre patch and we put in close to 3,000 trees and shrubs in there. But we decided that if we were going to be embarking on this long-term reforestation endeavor, it would make sense to figure out what's the most effective way to do that. So we uh, have set up this first patch as an experiment. We're testing different approaches to reforestation. Specifically, we're testing changes in density and then also changes in the structural composition of those uh, communities that we're planting, whether they have just canopy trees in them or also include trees and shrubs. So we basically have a factorial design here with all combinations of sparse and dense plantings understory and no understory, including a natural succession plot, which in the random setup of this experiment happened to fall right in the, the corner there, closest to the uh, adjacent woodland, so it, it may get off to a good start. Yes, it may do rather well, if, you know, in comparison with the other plots, um, given the you know, natural seed fall of uh, the surrounding woodland. It'll be really interesting to see, and we do intend in our next uh, iterations of this to uh, basically create replicates for ourselves over time. And we're hopeful that uh, we will find at least the trade-offs between uh, different approaches, if not necessarily one superior approach in all respects. Well, I think there are a lot of interesting things about this project, this research design. You know, one of, of course, uh, one of which is, you know, how does, how does uh, a given uh, diversity of species, how do they interact with each other? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, something else that I think is, is, is captured here, if people notice that you know, the, the uh, spacing between plants varies at uh, two scales, um, a closer plaquette spacing and a broad, wider plaquette spacing, um, and the proximity of plants to one another actually may have a very direct, uh, strong influence on their um, early growth um, response. And it's kind of counterintuitive, right, that the yeah. plants that are planted closer together grow faster? That's what we, we assume from the classical literature. Obviously, you know, more plants in a given area have to share a limited resource, and therefore each individual would be smaller. Um, we are out in the, in, the, in the outdoors, though, in the real world, and in this case, we may find that um, actually there is a signal that tends to stimulate plants to outcompete their neighbors as a means of survival. And the, prox the closer proximity of those plants, which may be a result of uh, some kind of reflected uh, light from their foliage, may actually increase cell elongation in their neighbors. And it would be interesting to see how that plays out here and how it might apply to the plantings that we're doing in the, uh, the tree canopy world within the gardens and grounds. As we discussed before, we're trying to figure out what is the, the right density. Absolutely. And also, you know, the fact that we're not just uh, 
you're not just testing uh, various tree species in combinations with one another, you're also including a shrub layer that will compete differentially with, uh, with the, the tree, uh, the metal population of trees that are there. Yeah. Another, the other thing is that last plot in the lower left, which is a bit different than all the others. Uh, and you're talking the about the, the mowing yes. versus non-mowing? Yeah, for whatever reason, it's been kind of a traditional practice in this region to mow uh, between your trees in your restoration plantings. I think the the two reasons for doing that are to reduce competition from the herbaceous plants that are growing there for nutrients and water, etc., uh, and also to reduce the habitat for voles and discourage them from gnawing on your newly planted seedlings. But of course in mowing you are eliminating the possibility for any natural regeneration to occur. Um, so we are experimenting. We have two plots that are at that same density and composition and one is mowed and one is unmowed. So we'll see which does better over time. Right, and of course from a functioning perspective there's also the issue of mechanical damage from mowing the well, sure. yeah. which um, this orchard uh, family approach might not be the best for it. And I'll just throw out there one last uh, image on that topic that suggests just as we are creating a diversity of habitats with a past dynamics framework within the tree canopy in the gardens, we're also doing that on the natural lands and we hope that by uh, doing this reforestation project over time we create a variety of different shrubland and, and forest habitats throughout our natural lands. Great. Well, Travis, this has been a really inspiring discussion. Um, well, I have one last question for you. Would you tell, tell us what all this has meant to you as, as a proponent of ecological aesthetics, all, all the work that you're doing? Well, it's just been a really exciting opportunity for me to get to take some of the ideas that I developed almost as an intellectual exercise to ask myself what would it mean to design and manage landscapes ecologically and, and put those principles into action on the ground. Uh, and that was a wonderful place and my job is, is a very exciting one in that I get to work at that across this whole continuum from a very intentionally designed and highly manicured landscapes all the way to uh, a restoration style setting. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to express my enthusiasm to Mount Cuba Center. It's, it's an amazing destination for anyone who is involved as, in designing naturalistic gardens. It's one of the great uh, uh, Delaware Valley estate gardens uh, here in the Grandy You know, uh, it's a native plant research facility, extensive array of workshops and classes. And it's a state of the art blending of nature and art. Thanks, Lyle. That, that means a lot to me to hear you say that. Um, for those of you who are interested, I put the website there and you can uh, find out more about what's going on at Mount Cuba. And we are reopening for general admission on April 1st, so if you're in the area, stop by and see us. And uh, if you don't already have it on your bookshelf, you know, consider picking up a copy of my book. It's available on Amazon and uh, IndieBound and other okay. places as well. Yes. Well, why don't we see if Penny has any questions for us? Great. Yes, thank you. We have several questions from the audience. Uh, the first is, are there any white papers or research findings on all of these various studies that you had? Uh, this particular question is about the native R issue, but we have other questions that have come in asking about the research on um, any of the research topics that you mentioned. The um, research that's being done in our trial garden is probably the best documented at this point in time. So we have our in-house research reports that are produced, and then as I mentioned, we um, students that we've been working with at the University of Delaware will be publishing their results over the coming months and years for the cultivar studies. 
the work that we're doing in the natural lands is really getting up and going, and so uh, we're in the data collection phase and have yet to uh, publish any results in the literature or, or even more informally. Um, but we're happy to uh, hear more about how we're thinking things, thinking about things with uh, Okay, the next question is about deer browsing. How do you keep all of those beautiful plants from uh, being deer browsed? We do have a deer fence that surrounds the gardens and we patrol that. Um, additionally, we have a managed hunting program for all of our lands as do some of the, uh, the neighboring properties. And so we uh, you know, are attempting in a long-term way to bring the populations to a more manageable level. OK. The next question is about uh, maintenance. We have a few different questions about maintenance. The first is on what measures are you taking to manage invasive species? Mm -hmm. um, well, we do quite a bit of work to manage invasive species, um, and our goal is not to eliminate them, um, apart from the more highly maintained areas of the, the gardens, but to uh, reduce the population sizes, and we do that through a combination of mechanical control and um, control. All right. Uh, the next is on how, what do you do to maintain the edge of your woodlands so that the trees and shrubs don't encroach? Mm -hmm. Oh, so that they don't encroach? We're, we're in many cases happy for them to encroach, uh, looking in the, the natural areas there. Um, what we what we are most concerned about is the preponderance of invasives in those areas. Um, so, sort of to follow up on that previous question, at the same time, we've done a rotation through our property over the last three years, where we tackled a third of our edges in each year and uh, mechanically removed, selectively removed all of the invasive species that we find growing there and then followed up the subsequent year with uh, a chemical control of the reflush of any species that have popped back up again. Um, and that we are anticipating in this year, now that we've completed the full rotation, will um, set us up to have to do much less either mechanical or chemical control. And in some cases, uh, we're able to just count on the existing uh, seedlings that come up, the native seedlings, to help build those same niches. In other cases, we've supplemented with some additional planting. Um, where we have places like the meadow within the gardens, uh, we simply mechanically remove the unwanted tree species that keep popping up there. Can you comment on the correlation between ecological landscapes and low maintenance landscapes, and they are specifically looking at low input landscapes? Sure. I, I think in, uh, in an ideal sense, in a theoretical sense, the, the perfectly designed ecological landscape would be a low maintenance landscape in that you're putting the right plants in the right place, you're allowing natural processes of competition to uh, take care of some of your weed issues. You have a diversity of material that supports beneficial organisms, so your pest control issues are, are less. And we do see all of those things playing out here at Mount Cuba, but I at least personally have yet to design uh, a landscape that doesn't require any management at all. Uh, even in our Natural land get the uh, of we uh, we still 
have issues with invasive species, they'll want to guide evolution with those plant types. I think we want to see a positive in these systems in collaboration with nature. I don't think we can help to take ourselves out of the picture entirely. Okay. We have several questions that are looking for your your input on the philosophy of replacing the original forest with new plant material. Some of the questions are saying, isn't the original ecology the ideal? And just wondering what your take is on that. Uh, I guess it would depend a little bit which of the circumstances we're talking about within the, uh, the gardens or within the natural lands. Um, we in this region have very few high quality reference ecosystems to work with. Um, and when we go back, try to go back in time, you know, 300 years before a lot of this clearing took place, the documentation is, is much more sparse. So to some degree, you know, I think we're, by, we're forced to invent a future for ourselves um, for lack of information. Um, that said, I think there's a really uh, powerful role that regeneration from within the system uh, can play. Certainly, the tulip poplars that are within our uh, canopy within the garden largely come from natural regeneration within the site. And in the, uh, the Natural Lands Restoration Project as well, uh, the regeneration that we hope to see by not mowing will capture the advantages of local genetics. At the same time, we don't have the species on the property currently that probably grew here at the same time. There's a value in reintroducing some of the and then as we imagine the future shaped by climate change, uh, we're forced to look decades down the road and anticipate what will grow well here in new conditions and uh, consider planting things that adapted to that. All right. Uh, this one is a follow-up on what you've just been discussing. Is there a way to take the original forest matrix and bend it into a garden on a residential scale? Sure. And it can depend on your exact situation. Um, but you know, if you have a sort of second growth woodland, as you know, many people do in their, uh, their backyard uh, with some uh, selected planting or removal, depending on the density, you, know, you could add in the, uh, the other layers that you would hope to see, uh, understory trees and shrubs, and then based on the light conditions that result, uh, you know, do some additional herbaceous planting. And this is something, Lyle, that you've been working on uh, as well through the Extension Service, right? Yes, exactly. Um, you know, I see uh, a large portion of our um, residential um, area here in the eastern U.S. is having really sort of uh, reemerged as something of an urban forest in the making, uh, quite in some cases not intentionally, um, as people suddenly discover that they live under a forest canopy that may not have been there 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and um, now what we we're looking at is exactly what Travis is talking about, among other things, is this restoration of the um, of the vertical layers. Um, in most cases, um, the overstory canopy is 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 in place again, um, and now we need to look uh, underneath that canopy, and in some cases, actually manage that canopy in ways that allow um, the understory to. Um, begin to uh, resemble what it may have looked like uh, in a time uh, 
prior to development, but in a new context in which we are now integrating our, our, um, our living spaces and our lifestyles into this um, basically a living garden environment. Very good. Uh, a couple of questions have come in on nut trees. One is how are the chestnut trees doing? And another question came in, do you have other types of nut trees where you have challenges for what you plant beneath them? Oh, I see. Well, as to the first question about the chestnuts, um, these are the hybrid back crossed chestnuts from the American Chestnut Foundation, which should have the uh, genes for blight resistance among their 15, 16 American chestnut genes. Um, but of course, each one is a, is a different cross, so each one has a chance to perform a little differently. So far, uh, they are growing vigorously, uh, and they are also very attractive to uh, the bucks that manage to sneak within our deer fence. So a number have been rubbed. That's the, the leading cause of mortality at the moment. As to the issue of the nut trees and allelopathy, I think is being referred to, um, we have hickories throughout the gardens, uh, and they seem to integrate well into the forest canopy. Um, the walnuts that we have are primarily in lawn areas currently, so we haven't had to tackle too many of those issues directly. Have you been doing anything to manage the woolly adelgid and the hemlocks? Yes, we've been doing a number of things to manage the, the woolly adelgid. Most recently, we've been doing a combined approach of uh, releasing biological control. We've been experimenting with the ST beetles, um, which are a Japanese beetle that feed on the woolly adelgid. We've done that in some of these on an experiment. And uh, we have yet to see clear results, but we are hopeful. Um, additionally, we have been uh, using horticultural oils on hemlocks that can be effectively sprayed. And we have also uh, used uh, dinotefuron, I think is the uh, chemical name, Safari is the brand name it comes under, uh, so you know, an insecticide a systemic insecticide that we've injected into certain ones of the hemlocks. So our hope is really to manage the, the decline of the hemlock populations here through uh, hanging on to the most important ones for a you know, time span of 10 years when we slowly kill the others and uh, reforest in their wake. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Travis and Lyle, for this incredible presentation. If, if any of us needed further motivation for transitioning to ecolog ecological practices, you have certainly given it to us this afternoon.